have another in our series of uh, water in the Wimberley Valley. This will be the ninth one. And, uh, and uh, by the time we're through, we're gonna have a pretty good idea of the different aspects of water. Um, when, when I was thinking about the program tonight and who, who is watching out for me in terms of my water, um, I couldn't help but think about um, how lucky we are that we don't really have to think a whole lot about the quality of our water and it's only when something goes wrong um, that it becomes a, a huge issue and I couldn't help but think about what was going on in, in Flint, Michigan where all of a sudden their, their city water just turned bad and, and uh, if there was if there was ever an example, a case example of uh, the subject of our, uh, our program tonight is what, what is government doing for me in terms of water? Uh, that brings it to mind. I'm really pleased to have as a speaker of this, Tom Hegemeyer, who's a fellow with the Meadows Center for Water over at uh, Texas State University. And let's give a big, Wimberley Lions Club, welcome to Tom Hegemeyer. Thank you, friend. I'm kind of curious, how many of y'all were involved in the last couple of years and got to attend a stakeholder meeting for the Cypress Creek Watershed Protection Program? It was sponsored by the Meadows Center and it was looking at developing a, a plan for Cypress Creek and the Blanco River to help keep the water clean and pure and flow. This is kind of a spinoff of that and also rolls into what's happening next in this watershed over the next two and a half to three years. Okay, good. So uh, Frank asked me to talk about also some of the water quality rules and regulations that are, in, that are in place today and how they're working and that dovetails into the Cypress Creek project and what could happen in the future. And hopefully y'all can get involved, uh, stay tuned as we promote and try to get more input on what happens in this community in the coming years to keep that water clean, pure and flowing. And so kind of why do we care, back to Frank's point, having good water quality. Uh, we want to have our creeks and rivers clean. Also, if we have a lot of development, which is planned for this area, this might be good for your market days in the future, as more and more people show up. Uh, but it's going to bring a lot more impervious cover and more runoff and flow, which could blow out your creeks. It can damage roads and bridges and uh, also pipelines, things like that. So. Um, these things that could happen in the future might really impact your water quality if we do nothing about it. So kind of the impervious cover effect, and impervious cover is parking lots and buildings and rooftops, and they shed more water, obviously, than, than just the natural ground. So about four to five times more runoff happens when you pave over an area, and if that's not managed, uh, it can really cause downstream problems. Also, it affects how much water goes into the ground for your aquifer. If it's all paved over, you're not getting the recharge that you normally get. So uh, that impacts also your quantity of water. And I think a key point is, if you don't have quantity in the aquifer, then your creeks and rivers go dry. There's a direct connection with your aquifers and rivers. And so that's the biggest environmental impact is when your creeks and rivers go dry prematurely. You know, we, we, uh, we do have drought, you know, creeks and rivers go dry, but this would make it more often and last longer if we uh, don't manage this properly. So the state water plan is showing some pretty heavy projections for population growth in southern Hayes County, about 340,000 people by 2060. It's kind of mind-boggling, 160,000 people in San Marcos, and about 40,000 people projected here in the valley. It's about 5,000 now per Google when I did that search here this weekend. So it looks like a huge increase in population is forecast for this area which means more roads and buildings and rooftops, which brings more impervious cover and more runoff and more water quality and uh, flood challenges. So to show you kind of what Austin's done, which could be kind of translated to here in the future, uh, Austin's had a stormwater detention for flood type projects um, or flood detention to protect downstream landowners. And there's about 4,000 detention basins in Austin today. And it's designed for flooding, trying to not increase runoff on your downstream property owner. These also can function as parks, and so they can be multi-purpose too, which is something that I think should be strived for, is not just 
one dimensional but make it multi dimensional. Oops. So then you have the water quality side of things. And a pretty common technique is called the sand filter system, where water flows into the top of the screen. It kind of runs across some dirt. It kind of sits there for a while, and then it's metered out on top of it. The lower part of the screen is a big sandbox in a way. And the water infiltrates through the sand into a perforated pipe and then drains back to the creek. There's almost 3,000 of these in Austin today. It's kind of the practice of TCEQ also uh, mostly encourages in the recharge zone, which, the, which does affect your area here. And these are good for creek erosion to prevent that rapid acceleration of uh, down cutting and things like that that can inf impact your infrastructure. Wet ponds are about 200 in the Austin area. It's more of a lake essentially. And by having a water quality pool, you can uh, have some settling of nutrients and sediment and stack your flood protection on top. Uh, the problem is these ponds need water in this area. We don't have good average rainfall. It's always nothing or tons. And so it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to use your water supply to put water in the lake and then it evaporates. And so it's kind of being discouraged in this area, these kind of, tr these, these kind of practices. They're, they're, uh, they're probably good on the East Coast, also where it rains a lot, but probably not so good here. But a lot of folks from Houston seem to bring these up with them when you have, when you have Houston developers come this way. They like those you know, wet ponds in the Austin area. Another key thing is creek buffer zones are having a setback from the creek to maintain the natural character of the creek. You can kind of see that blue-gray line. And so these areas are not developed and they're preserved. And so you can uh, get some natural filtering, filtering and recharge through these systems. And, that can make a big difference. Uh, just down in north of San Antonio, I was there last week, and uh, off to your left is what the creek was, and then to your right is a big concrete ditch. And so this just pushes a flood down to somebody else, there, and there's no recharge and, and no water quality treatment. So I, I think creek buffer zones are really a key technique to preserve the natural system and also get your water quality and flood protection and of course it's ugly and over time it gets graffiti on it and it becomes a skateboard park and uh, things like that. Current practices like detention ponds and things like that are kind of incentivized in the current ordinances and uh, they do take a lot of land and there's no really water supply benefit so we'll talk about in a minute some other ways you can do this that also provide more techniques or tools but also look a lot better too. But we'll get to kind of Frank's point on who's protecting, who's watching out for you today on the stormwater side of things and water quality. And you're in the contributing zone of the Edmonds Aquifer here in this area. And so back in the late 90s, TCEQ or Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, back then they were called TNRCC or train wrecks and people called them. Um, they have a code of regulations that's for developments five acres or more. If they're, if they're more than that area in size and also more than 20% impervious cover, then they put in some water quality basins or different treatment uh, type techniques to improve water quality. TCQ rules do not have any kind of buffer zones though, so not those creek setbacks. But the most common practice is that sand filter with like the concrete walls and they're not real attractive and there's some better ways. The city of Wood Creek uh, has a pretty good list of ordinances on your website um, that, that deals with water quality and also flood protection. And it has a pretty high bar being set for managing 90% of the pollution increase. The TCQ Edwards rules isn't quite that high on, on improving the water quality. Um, there's also uh, some erosion control type criteria in Wood Creek. Uh, and also creek buffer zones that begin at 50 acres. So it's, it's, it's a pretty good ordinance, I think, you, you have in the city of Wood Creek uh, to protect the water quality uh, during uh, growth and new development. The city, the city of Wimberley didn't quite have, have that extensive list of water quality protection uh, on like the 90% uh, of its overall treatment. Uh, they kind of defer to TCQ Edwards program, which kind of makes sense. You don't want to have overlapping rules. It gets kind of problematic to trying to get approval from one agency and then one from another for a different set of guidelines. So it doesn't make sense to have one consistent set of regulations. Maybe you just want to have it a little bit better. That maybe includes creek buffer zones and things like that. 
Um, it's also a comprehensive plan Wormbly has that looks out in the future as to where growth might happen and also its intensity. And so that's a good guide as to how you would uh, work your regulations with uh, future development. Then Hayes County is more focused on flood control and flood detention, and they defer to TCQ also on the water quality side. And they have uh, floodplains designed for uh, creeks with areas of, of 64 acres or more. So you're seeing some buffer zone activity, um, just not as detailed maybe as, as San Marcos now is proposing creek buffer zones down to five acres. So that means almost every creek, every little tributary would have a protective zone to help with filtering water and uh, also solving the flood situation. Hayes County may do a drainage criteria manual later in the uh, it, in like the coming year, so there may be an opportunity to get involved with them to help them draft criteria that can also benefit you and the entire county. Some different practices kind of back to some alternatives to what we saw, just the more constructed big box type stuff. Uh, it was like conservation landscaping, rainwater harvesting, rain gardens are a good option around here, and then pervious pavers. Also, these can provide water supply benefits, and so we think it's good to it's good to have um, some kind of facility that can do more than just stormwater detention or water quality, but also help, uh, re help reduce your water demands and uh, also boost your water supply. So that's something that's being thought about in the Cypress Creek project that's coming up. And so conservation landscaping is one option, uh, which is more using native plants and materials versus big lawns and turf and just having good soil good native plants with a lot less chemicals that are applied to the landscape, and it takes 70% less water. So it's also filtering your stormwater, but in the process, you're also putting less demand on your aquifer and also your water supplies. So it can be a water quality device with those water supply benefits. It's kind of an overall view of what it could look like on steroids there on your right, where someone really just put in all the native plants and had no turf at all. Um, so it's and it could also kind of blend in with a natural hill country approach around here and it ties into your long range development plan too. Rainwater collection, y'all probably seen this quite a bit in the area. I know there's uh, like many homes in Hayes County that now have rainwaters or sole water supply. And so this can also store your storm water and not have it run off so quickly that meet your uh, in-house or in-building demands. And the rain gardens are kind of a smaller pond where they're shallow but it's planted with native plants and so they can be maybe a foot deep hold the water have it infiltrate in the ground so it doesn't run off very quickly but it uh, gives you some water quality benefits slows down the floods and then watering is not required for this because it gets watered every rainfall event but so you have the right plants that can withstand drought and also uh, a whole bunch of water when it does arrive and the traffic depressions uh, on your left, you'll see it's pretty common where they have a curb and the tree's elevated. And so no water gets to the tree unless you put an irrigation system. So it looks, it's like in a desert almost in a way. And so it kind of makes sense on the right if you can sink those areas and have the natural water from the parking lots flow into them and give them a good soaking. Uh, and then you're, they can be a rain garden and also do some water quality treatment. And uh, so it kind of makes sense to move more towards storage versus just trying to irrigate some high desert point. And then we have pervious pavers is the picture here on the right where the water actually flows through the pavement. And there's an underground reservoir of rock like uh, maybe 12 inches deep. So the water can sit in that rock as a perforated pipe if your soils aren't really, uh, I guess, sandy and then that can drain out over time. And so you can actually store your runoff under your parking lot, not have a big pond or big basin, so you can have more room for doing the, doing the project you want to do. So combining this with your, uh, like your rain gardens and tree islands and things like that, you can do a more comprehensive plan that's more attractive and also fits into your site and then meets the water supply side as well. Problem with these new methodologies are that like, like in the TCEQ rules and regulations, it's not real clear how to get a permit. And so if a developer and his engineers don't see a clear path to a permit that requires waivers or variances, they're gonna probably not go that way because it takes more time. Your time is money in the development process. 
And so we need to have more simple approaches that are also in the codes and criteria that can uh, make it more of a fast track process to see more implementation. So what can we do as a whole? I think, you know, one is water conservation to keep, off, keep more water in the ground, keep more water in the creeks and rivers. It's like the low flow shower heads and low flow toilets. And if we can do more conservation landscaping and not put water on large turf lawns, there could be several thousand gallons applied each night, you know, to one uh, yard. So um, that's just something that, that we can all do, I think, to improve the environment and also the water quality and the quantity of the water in our creeks and aquifers. Building a rain garden, it's a little small, it can be maybe 200 square feet, you know, 10 by 20. And you can have a depression area by your rain spouts or downspouts and have some native plants in it. So something that we can all do that's pretty easy and also very affordable. And then talk to your neighbors and share information about the Cypress Creek project that's coming up. And I'll do a little bit of that right now. Uh, TCQ and EPA just approved the grant, uh, about $804,000 of federal money is coming to the valley over the next two and a half years uh, for a total project of about $1.3 million because we found match and things like that to put this grant together. And so uh, you'll be seeing more information coming out about uh, how you can get involved, uh, some of the things that are intended from this money are doing some more rain guards, rainwater collection, uh, also porous pavement, things like that in the community to be demonstration projects that can show folks and also developers what they can do. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking at the rules and regulations and the codes. Let's try to incentivize these practices if we can in the area and work with TCQ in the process to uh, find a win-win there. And then looking at source water protection, looking at land conservation, and some research and study. So a lot of things will be happening. I'll be heavily involved in the projects. So you might be seeing me around some more in the future. I hope so. And uh, we great to get your input. You can follow us at that website, and I'll provide my contact info here. Um, so you can call me or email me, and I'll be happy to answer your questions or let you know how you can get involved if you'd like to. All right, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.